Oppenheimer was a really most complex individual. During the war, he was the founder and the leader of Los Alamos. And I have seen many laboratories of this kind, and many directors, even more directors. There is absolutely nobody who begins to compare in excellence with Robert Oppenheimer. He knew a thousand people well, knew them what made them tick, found a way how to stimulate their work. And you know, he understood what was going on in every nook and cranny of the laboratory. It was simply incredible. After the war, he appeared to be a very different person. During the war, he even argued that the atomic bomb should be dropped on Hiroshima, on Japan. After the war, he was pushing in the direction of stopping further effort, perhaps on nuclear weapons, but certainly on the hydrogen bomb. We now know that had we not worked on the hydrogen bomb, the Soviets would have had it. And the Soviets, instead of catching up with us now, would have become a real danger to the free world 20 years earlier. I do not understand Oppenheimer's motivations, but I do know this, that to bring up this whole matter of Oppenheimer's views and actions, and bring it in connection with his security clearance was a dreadful mistake. It should not have been done. Its effects, apart from the real misery it meant for Oppenheimer and others, including me, its effect was to divide the scientific community in this country and divide it very deeply. And this division has contributed, may have been the main contributing force in the situation which the President has recently described, that the Soviet Union is ahead of us in nuclear weapons. I want to talk to you a little bit about that for a you moment. Know, this is a very dangerous point. And if we could have found a quiet way to deal with the problem of Oppenheimer. He wanted to do science. He should have done science. He also wanted to get mixed in politics. And the politicians did not know how to keep him out of it. Those politicians who wanted to keep him out of it thought they had to re uh, revoke his clearance. I could not do anything but testify to facts. It was a most unfortunate situation. And Oppenheimer's character, to my mind, is extremely interesting and remains a mystery. In science, he wrote, defense against nuclear weapons is wishful thinking at best. You know, during the war, I went to Oppenheimer and I said, stimulated by Hungarian friend Leo Szilard, I said to him, we should not drop a bomb on Japan 
without first demonstrating it to Japanese. Oppenheimer said, people in Washington will make those decisions. You don't know anything about it. You should not speak. The responsibility seemed a bit too big for me. I was re relieved by Oppenheimer's argument. And now I am ashamed of it. You know, very many scientists, just in the sequel of the Oppenheimer case, turn their backs to national defense. And anything that smacks of their getting back to national defense has an automatic negative reaction. And yet, offense needs power. Defense needs foresight and intelligence. Unless we can work with as many excellent scientists as possible. Unless I go farther, we go and work with our allies and look after the fulfillment of our joint desire to maintain peace and freedom. It will be very hard because the intelligence needed to make defense a reality is of the highest order. The president has said that that what is known to the men in the Kremlin should be known to the American people. Unfortunately, our bureaucrats are deaf. The American people are kept uninformed about the real possibility and the real needs of defense. To call it Star Wars is nonsense. Defense has many sides. It has a component in space. It has many components here on Earth. And it needs ingenuity and more ingenuity. I don't say that we have it now. I do say that we are on the ro road to it. And my younger friends have produced a really remarkable flood of excellent ideas, which at first I did not want to believe. I am now convinced that among the half dozen good ideas for defense, at least one, hopefully two or three or four, will work out. I mean defense, which is less expensive than the offense that our opponents would have to put forth to overcome this defense. If we can make defense really inexpensive and effective, then the cautious men in, Kremlin, in the Kremlin will never dream of attacking. And then we can replace this horrible idea of mutual assured destruction, well, this it, mutual assured survival. Are, are we talking about materials here that are classified which should not be classified? Yes. Are you saying to me that these deaf bureaucrats are perpetuating this system? Yes. All right. <laughs> not, not to beat around the bush. Out of curiosity, uh, in advance... Not necessarily idle curiosity. Never idle curiosity. In advance of President Reagan's speech, calling for the development of this weapon. To what extent does, does a president, under those circumstances, call Edward Teller and ask his, his views on these matters? That's surely to not classified. satisfy your justified curiosity, <laughs> I will say, to some extent. You've been working on this at, uh, at Livermore for some time, haven't you? With some intensity and with almost no money, except practically stolen money or diverted money for three years. Now you're going to get this tape confiscated. They're going to try to find out where that money was stolen from. Uh, from, we made, we changed the test, made one part of the test a little less perfect, and instead attached some other 
little what nuts the test. Somebody once called that creative management. <laughs> it applies in science as well. Well, you know, if you want to be exceedingly kind, creative management. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> What do you say, Dr. Teller, to those who argue in reaction to President Reagan's proposal for the development of this new defensive weapon that it in fact does represent an escalation in the arms race, which could in turn lead to a first strike by a potential adversary who might fear nuclear blackmail if and when such a def defensive we weapon were in place? I am very happy you asked that question because the question is completely absurd. Well, there you go. Now, look, give, me, give, me, give me a third answer. <laughs> look, I will, I will give you two examples. And it shows my limited, polarized, unintelligent thinking. If the Soviets had a weapon, a system of defensive weapons, that would ensure them against a retaliatory strike from the United States. I think we would very fast belong to the Soviet Union. If we had such a weapon, and the Soviets did not, I am very sure that we are not going to attack the Soviet Union even if we are sure that they can't hit back. You know, I think there is a little difference between the United States and the Soviet Union. And I will not go so far as to say that we are good and they are evil. But I will say that there is a difference, a little difference. And if you will pardon my French, I will add to it, vive la différence. <laughs> I pardon your French. I claim that of all the wars of the United States, there was only one in which the American people were really united. They were not united in the War of Independence. They were not united in the First World War, and certainly not in the Civil War. They were completely, we were completely disunited in Vietnam, and the consequences were tragic. We were united in the Second World War. Roosevelt managed to unite, it, to unite the United States. And when we were really united, we produced miracles. The United States cannot fight unless it is united. And the American people will never agree in a united fashion to start a nuclear war. I wouldn't agree to that. And I am supposed to be a hawk. The mass of the people will never agree. And no American administration will ever dare to do such a thing. I wish I could say similar things about the Soviet Union. You're every bit as powerful a personality as I had been told to expect, Dr. Teller. Could we go back to something you said the moment ago? Which you mean I talk a little loudly? You do a good job of it. <laughs> now, we're going to be out of time. It's the most fascinating argument, it seems to me, in science in this century. When I does tell you how you balance it. You do what is right. You try to find out what is right or what you are convinced, and you do it. And when I am asked to testify about Oppenheimer, I did not know what I will be asked. I did not know what I will say. But I did know that I had a civic duty to testify. 
Dr. Teller, we're going to be out of time just momentarily. Uh, back to your friend, Freeman Dyson. He tells a wonderful story about coming to his home, his own home one day, and hearing beautiful and music. And playing Bach. Uh, yes. Bach. very nice, very simple prelude of Bach. Does Bach his taste and my taste coincide. I think he said he learned math from Bach. Is that I possible? did not. No, that he I, did. That I he know, did. I know. But I wouldn't go that far. But I will say that classical music is, apart from science, the most wonderful thing. Dr. And politics is the worst. Dr. Because Teller, whether or gonna, not you succeed, let me, let me you just, are always sorry about it. Let me just say good night to our viewers, and we'll continue this conversation while they roll credits over it. Thanks for joining us. I'm Hal Rhodes. Obviously, we're delighted in having Dr. Teller with us tonight. See you tomorrow. Politics is worse than classical music. That's a fascinating scientific piece. But thesis. I hope that was on tape. It was on tape. We're still on tape.